Okay, let's get started. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us this morning. This is session 18 of our Thompson Rogers webinar series. My name is Adam Karakolis, and I'll be presenting today along with my colleague, Stacey Stevens, who you'll see in the other screen. Our topic today is chronic pain, concussions, and the MIG. Before we start, we'd like to remind everyone that we're continuing our prize draw this year and we'll offer one $50 everything card to a lucky winner at each session. The everything card is a gift card that you can redeem at almost any place you can think of. At the end of today's session, we'll pick a random number and correspond it to the order number in which you register for this webinar. Be sure to stay until the very end to find out who the winner is. Uh, another note for questions, uh, we ask that you please submit them using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. So you'll see at the bottom of your screen, you'll probably have a chat button and to the left of it, a button that says Q&A. Click that Q&A button to submit your questions and uh, we'll be sure to answer them. So uh, without further ado, we'll get into our intro within the intro to our topic, chronic pain, concussions, and the MIG. Stacey, I turn it over to you. Thanks, Adam, and welcome, everybody. It's great to have you here again, and I uh, have to say we're looking forward to when we get back to doing these in person. Um, we're not going to have any slides today. Adam and I are going to keep this relatively conversational, so like you said, if you've got any questions, just post them in the Q&A, um, and we'll keep an eye on that. What we want to do is we've picked some key cases uh, from the LAT, some recent decisions that deal with chronic pain, concussions, and the MIG. Um, so hopefully we can give you guys some great advice in terms of being able to ensure that the proper documentation, the proper evidence is in place to help get your clients the treatment that they, they need. So Adam, if you would like to start. Yes. So the first decision that we want to talk to you about is ZR and Certus Direct Insurance Company. It's a 2020 case. And at issue in this case was an application for catastrophic impairment under the SAPS. This is the post 2016 SAPS. And specifically this dealt with a applicant who was under, the 18, uh, under 18 years of age at the time of the accident and who had suffered a traumatic brain injury. So in this case, the result was that the applicant was not deemed cat. And we thought that the reasons why were relevant to you folks. So uh, I'm just going to get you to this, get to the specific section here in my notes. So this is section 3.115I of the statutory accident benefit schedule, which we're going to refer to as the SAPS. And this states that a person who is under the under 18 years of age at the time of the accident and has a traumatic brain injury that meets one of the following criteria can be deemed CAT. Uh, the criteria, again, that we're looking at is I, which is the insured person is accepted for admission on an inpatient basis to a public hospital named in a guideline with positive findings on, and it lists a number of uh, imaging uh, techniques, which include uh, computerized axial tomography scan or a CAT scan, uh, magnetic resonance imaging, MRI, or any other medically recognized brain diagnostic technology, which indicates intracranial pathology that is a result of the accident, including but not limited to intracranial contusions or hemorrhages, diffuse axonal injury, cerebral edema, midline shift, or pneumocephaly. Apologies for my pronunciation. I'm not uh, a trained medical professional like you folks. I want to break that down a little bit, okay? There's two there's two criteria here. The first is that the person is accepted on an inpatient basis to a hospital named in the guideline. And the second part of this criteria is there's with positive findings on some sort of imaging that show intracranial pathology. What's unique about this case is that the applicant was admitted on an inpatient basis to hospital after the accident. After leaving the hospital, the uh, applicant underwent a SPECT scan, which is uh, a type of imaging technology. It was actually canvassed by uh, Thompson Rogers' very own David McDonald in uh, the October 12th webinar. So if you want to learn more about SPECT scans, uh, check out the recording for that webinar. But uh, so chronologically, admitted as an inpatient, released from hospital, sometime after undergoes a SPECT scan. Now, 
the definition for this criteria for catastrophic impairment states it has to be an admission on an inpatient basis with the imaging findings. And the question in this case was, excuse me, does with mean that the imaging has to be conducted while the applicant is an inpatient? Or as in the case of the applicant, can it be, in, can it be conducted after they finish their inpatient treatment? And unfortunately for, for applicants and injured, injured people, the, the lat said no. The lat said, you must have the scan, the imaging that shows this, this intracranial pathology while you are an inpatient. So unfortunately, for people who like to apply for CAT under this category, it's very important that this imaging occurs while they're an inpatient and not after, because the lat seems to be pretty clear here. Now, another important part of this case is that for the purposes of, of this LAT application, the insurer was willing to admit that a spec scan meets the definition of any other medically recognized brain diagnostic technology, which is a great victory because, and you can learn more if, again, you go watch David McDonald's October 12th webinar, a spec scan is unique in that it is a more sensitive mm -hmm. piece of brain imaging technology it can detect brain injuries that an MRI or a CAT scan, for example, may not be sensitive enough to detect. So it's a great tool to recognize brain injury when it's been suffered by uh, an applicant that perhaps the older or previous tools would, would not be so sensitive to uh, accept. So I guess what I wanna ask Stacy is, given this criteria that the scan has to, occur while the person is an inpatient, uh, what can treatment providers do to make sure that happens? What, what are some solutions? Um, so there are a couple different solutions. You can, um, you know, depending on where the client is, you can try to lobby the facility to get one done. But I suspect that with um, OHIP constraints, time constraints, and all those other things, you're not going to get very far with them. Um, do the treatment plan get it submitted while the client is still in the hospital. Um, if you're considering um, someone who's got a, um, a head injury, if you're looking at they're going to be discharged soon, I believe it's still worthwhile to get it in and get it submitted. Um, if the insurer then turns around and denies it, or you know if they approve it, but then the client's been discharged, then they will give us some leverage to make the argument that at least the request was made and what, whether there's a delay that's been put on by the insurer or whether or not um, it's something we can get funding with, that's something we have to argue later. But I would go ahead and at least do the treatment plan and get it in while the person is still in the hospital. And keep in mind as well that you know if there's a tort claim, all of this ends up being really great evidence for the tort case. So don't think just because the client has been discharged from the hospital that you shouldn't be ordering the spec scan if you think that it's going to help give us the evidence of the brain injury. And it's also important to remember that just because uh, an applicant might not qualify for CAT on this ground doesn't mean that there's not other grounds under the statutory accident benefit schedule that you can also be deemed CAT. So just because these very technical uh, requirements are not met uh, doesn't mean that the applicant's not going to be deemed CAT. There may be other avenues for you to explore. There's actually... Um... Uh, question. It says, so many cases lately seem to be applying based on a spec scan done years later. So those do or do not qualify. And based on our reading of the case, because they are, it's so specific um, based on the wording in the SABs, the way this decision has come out is that if the spec scan is done after the minor has been discharged from a hospital, um, that may be something that prevents them from being uh, deemed catastrophic under that specific section in the SAFs. Okay, let me just check over here. Yep, the in-hospital in imaging is only required for um, 
minors. We've got cases where we've dealt with adults who have been discharged from the hospital or perhaps who haven't even spent a night in the hospital. And we still end up with positive imaging after the fact. And we've been able to get them deemed catastrophic. Okay, so the next case is Wang and Aviva, and this is a 2021 decision. Interesting case. Um, the accident was October 18th, 2014. The uh, insured was initially put into the MIG and of course uh, ended up in front of the LAT to determine a couple of things. One is whether or not their injuries were predominantly minor and whether or not there was a recommended physiotherapy treatment plan um, that should have been approved. And in this case, the adjudicator found that the client did not belong in the MIG. Um, from the case, we can take away a few things. Uh, first is just a reminder that the onus is on the insured person to be able to establish that they did not sustain predominantly minor injuries. And I'm not gonna go over the, the definition. We all know, um, I think we're all pretty familiar with what that is now. Um, the insured took the position that they should not be in the MIG because they suffered a concussion at the a time of the accident. The concussion is not part of the definition uh, found under section three sub one. Interestingly, Aviva agreed um, that yes, the person was diagnosed with a concussion, but they submitted that at the time the treatment plan was put in, which was about two years post-accident, the applicant wasn't exhibiting any concussion symptoms. And I found this really, this is actually a really interesting case because we know, we all know over time, um, you know, our clients do show some improvement. Uh, whether or not um, this particular person was not showing any symptoms, they don't give us that information um, in the decision. Um, but it's an interesting position that Aviva took. So what the, the LAT did was they went through the evidence and they agreed that concussion does not fit the definition of a minor injury. They looked at the family doctor's clinical notes and records that uh, 12 days following the, sorry, yeah, 12 days following the accident, there was a uh, diagnosis of concussion. Um, there were other clinical notes and records from service providers that were also looked at to confirm that over time, the person did have post-concussive symptoms. And although Aviva was pretty persistent in its argument, the LAT said no. A concussion is a concussion. Whether or not they're exhibiting symptoms at the time that the treatment plan went in is not relevant to whether or not this is predominantly a minor injury. So they took the insured out of the MIG, relying on the, the diagnosis that was made a couple of years earlier. Uh, and then they went on to deal with whether or not the treatment plan was reasonable and necessary. Um, the one of the things that I took away from this decision is what they say is that in determining whether or not a treatment plan is reasonable and necessary, they look at, are the treatment goals reasonable? whether the goals are being met to a reasonable degree and whether the costs, whether it be um, financial costs or the investment of time that's gonna be required to achieve the goals is reasonable taking into consideration the degree of success and the availability of any other treatment alternatives. Um, in this case, the person had had um, two accidents, and we see this a lot. Uh, the treatment plan went in under the first accident. And again, Aviva was pretty good at trying to argue that the injuries the person was now looking to have treated under the treatment plan or as a result of the second accident and not the first accident. Um, one of the things that helped win the day on this one is that the family doctor was very supportive. So again, another takeaway I think we can have from this decision is that it really shows the importance of good reporting 
consistent reporting, as well as, um, you know, recognizing that our clients will make improvements, right? There's, t- there's certain aspects of their injuries that are going to get better compared to others. So it was, a, it was nice to sort of see a very, um, the word that's coming to mind is honest, but I don't, I don't like to use that word because it implies obviously that, you know, there are people out there who aren't sort of accurately putting into their records what's going on, but it's just, it's nice to see the recognition that there is ebb and flow in terms of symptoms that our clients suffer. Just from, for me to add as well, I think it's important uh, from a treatment provider's perspective, you know, client education is very key to making sure that these types of injuries, especially concussions, get diagnosed. I've had clients go to discovery and just depose that they actually didn't know that a doctor, a family doctor could treat or do anything for a concussion. So they didn't mention it to the family doctor, educating clients about what a concussion is, what kind of symptoms come along with a concussion and, you know, encouraging, as we always encourage our clients to be honest and to, to raise all the symptoms and impairments that they're living with to their family doctors when they go to see them is uh, a good way to make sure that that type of uh, suffering, that pain, suffering injuries get into the doctor's notes so you can get that diagnosis that you need. And I know one of the questions uh, submitted beforehand was um, what kind of medical practitioner can actually make a concussion diagnosis? I've, full disclosure, I'm not a medical professional, but I've, I've went to the Concussions Ontario website and this reflects what we see in our practice as well. Uh, it's usually a physician, so that can be a family doctor. Uh, it can be a nurse practitioner and it also can be a neuropsychologist. So, um, getting the patient educated uh, before they go see those types of professionals about what kind of symptoms come with a concussion and uh, what to look for, you know, can go a long way to making sure that the concussion that the patient, the person is suffering actually does get into those medical practitioner notes. So you can use it if you need to get out of the MIG before the lat. But Stacy, I have another question for you. Um, if you don't get an immediate diagnosis of concussion, uh, but you go on to develop symptoms of the concussion at a later date, do you still need that diagnosis to get out of the MIG or are the symptoms um, enough? No, I, um, in my opinion, I think you still need the diagnosis, right? You can have all of the symptoms, um, but if you're going to get out of the MIG will be, I think what's will sort of seal the deal will be actually having the qualified professional make the diagnosis. Okay. And so, now we're going to move on to our third case. Mm-hmm. Uh, this case is uh, Kistanoglu and Certus Home and Auto Insurance Company. It's a 2021 decision. Um, at issue in this case, uh, uh, applicant wanted to get out of the MIG. There were uh, physiotherapy treatment plans at issue and a psychological assessment at issue as well. Uh, in this case, the applicant did not get out of the MIG. Uh, they were kept in the MIG by the lat, and uh, we'll see why. So. The applicant had two, uh, I would say, categories of injuries that they were suggesting would get them out of the MIG. The first is that uh, they had whiplash with radiculopathy and psychological impairments. Now, I think it just bears mentioning, I'm going to take uh, you to the definition for whiplash uh, as it appears in the SABs. Uh, for the purposes of the MIG, whiplash associated disorder means a whiplash injury that A, does not exhibit objective, demonstrable, definable, and clinically relevant neurological signs, and B, does not exhibit a fracture in or dislocation of the spine. So for the purposes of the MIG, if your client has whiplash, but they want to get out of the MIG, what you're going to need is some neurological signs. In this case, the applicant was saying, look, I have this radiculopathy from my whiplash. This is what this is the neurological sign that's going to get me out of the MIG or uh, a fracture or dislocation of the spine. So uh, here we see uh, the lat scrutinizing again, what kind of evidence comes out in the treatment records when making the decision about whether the applicant could get out of the MIG on this basis. And the lat said, no, uh, the reference to uh, radiculopathy came in a treatment plan. It was in an OCF-18. It wasn't something that showed up in the family physician uh, records. It wasn't a diagnosis that was made by another uh, professional. Unfortunately, this sends the signal to treatment providers that 
if um, something is going to get mentioned in an OCF 18, unfortunately, you have to find the basis for that in the clinical notes and records in the medical reports. Again, that goes back to our point about educating the client about signs and symptoms and advocating for the client so that these necessary uh, diagnoses can get made by the uh, treating professionals, by the family physicians, by the folks who are qualified to make those diagnoses. Unfortunately, uh, just having it in the OCF 18 was not enough for the LAT. Further, uh, it also speaks uh, to the need to be consistent. Uh, this radiculopathy um, was not something that appeared in other OCF 18s related to the whiplash. And so the LAT made a comment about that as well. So it just kind of shows that to the extent that there, we are able to have consistency across OCF 18s, we should also try to make sure we have that consistency. Now, I recognize that sometimes people heal, they get better, and a diagnosis might not apply across time. But if it, if it doesn't, then you know, the lad is going to look at the consistency of it being reported in OCF 18s when evaluating whether it's, it's something that they should find is, is there and is present. So on that ground, uh, did not get out of the MIG. The second ground uh, the applicant had tried to get, to get out of the MIG under is a psychological impairment. And uh, a psychological impairment is not something that's covered by the MIG definition in the SABS, which means that if you can prove a psychological impairment is there, you can get your way out of the MIG. Now, in this case, the psychological diagnoses that were made were made based on a pre-screening report from a psychologist. Uh, the LAT was critical about the pre-screening report because it didn't it just involve the, the self-report of the applicant. It didn't evo involve a review of the clinical notes and records. It didn't involve any testing or screening or, inter or a more in-depth interview. Now, um, the LAT said for these purposes, even though there was a professional making a diagnosis, the, I guess, support for that diagnosis was lacking. And on that ground, they found that there was no psychological injury established and they said, there's no whiplash with radiculopathy. There's no psychological impairment. You can't get out of the MIG. And so the treatment plans were also denied, which uh, begs, me, begs the question, and Stacy, maybe you can answer this one. If you're in the MIG and you do need that report to get you uh, a psychological impairment, and, and from this decision, it seems like the LAD is punishing pre-screening reports or it's not willing to accept pre-screening reports. What can you do to get that report funded? So, and that, you know, that's a really good question. And that is a huge problem because we know the limits are $3,500. And by the time you get around to looking at someone's psychological impairments, that money's gone. Um, a lot of firms will fund the cost of the report um, I know that's something that we do here. So my, you know, my immediate suggestion is, is talk to the lawyer. If you really think that there's significant psychological injuries that need to be explored, pick up the phone and talk to the lawyer, right? They're the ones, you know, at the end of the day who hopefully will be able to fund the report because it's going to, you know, it's going to, one, it's going to help the client first and foremost. And for those of you that know me, that worked with me, I'm a very, um, actually, actually both Adam and I are very client focused. Um, if it gets the client better and it's going to help them get the treatment that they need, we, we need to fund the report. And second of all, your evidence is, you know, is again, um, transferred over into the tort claim. The other thing um, you can also look at from, you know, the OT's perspective, the other, if there's a social worker involved, um, if there's any pre-screening type tests that you guys can do to show you know, the MOCA, the cognitive impairment, if there's any type of testing that you can start putting into place when you're doing your assessments to help identify the symptoms, that helps. Um, collateral evidence, when you're doing your initial interview, or if it's um, a follow-up assessment, talk to the family members. Just look for other areas where the evidence of psychological impairment can be, can be gathered from especially if it is a situation where, let's say, for example, there is no tort claim. And so the lawyer you're talking to is saying, look, you know, there's no tort claim. We're not going to recover our disbursement. We can't, we can't fund it. Start looking at alternate ways to get, that, um, to get that evidence because it's all going to be helpful in front of the lab. My next case 
um, is DR and cooperators. Um, another case where the insured was put into the MIG, and unfortunately, again, in this case, didn't work out for the for the insured, they were kept in the MIG. And it's really unfortunate because the treatment plans that were put in, my gosh, there was about 15 treatment plans, 13 treatment plans that had gone in and they had all been denied. So this is a uh, September 2017 accident. And um, like I said, the guy was in the MIG. What ended up happening, sort of the, the turning point on this decision um, was, an, it was interesting. It really highlights inconsistencies in reporting. So the, the gentleman developed chronic pain. And of course we know with chronic pain comes the psychological impairments. And the tribunal has already accepted that chronic pain is a condition that persists for three to six months after the initial triggering injury. So that wasn't in dispute. But um, in this case, the applicant was assessed by two different doctors. One was a doctor who specialized in chronic pain. The other one was an orthopedic surgeon. And um, the applicant said severe, constant pain, that it was causing him significant functional impairments, that he was relying on prescription and over-the-counter medication, and the psychosocial issues such as weight gain, sleep difficulty, performing at work were all things that were still um, affecting him. You know, the orthopedic surgeon, when he did his report, defined chronic pain in a much more fulsome way than the tribunal had in previous decisions. And what the orthopedic surgeon said is that chronic pain syndrome exist when symptoms persist far beyond the normal expected time of healing for the specific injury, often six months or longer. That's, that's okay, right? That, that sort of flows with the decision. But then he went on to say that chronic pain is intrusive in nature, unremitting, often not susceptible to conventional methods of treatment, often interferes with individuals' ADLs, vocational and avocational, and it's often accompanied by psychological and emotional problems. Okay, a little bit more fulsome, but it kind of hits the nail on the head. The problem is, is none of this was supported by the evidence. So this was the applicant's own expert who said this. But then when the um, adjudicator went through the records, he found, he or she, or was it she? Yeah, it was a she found that the family doctor's notes, the applicant's back pain comes and goes, intermittent. The applicant had reported to the chronic pain doctor, the other expert that he was relying on, that his pain was intermittent. Um, he had reported to his family doctor that he has ongoing back pain, but didn't get into the frequency of the pain. And that could be just, you know, family doctors are busy and overwhelmed and they're not going to write down, you know, word for word, everything that you say. So it could be something within the reporting, but the way to sort of back that up then is when you're a treatment provider, make sure, right? Just because the client says, oh my gosh, you know, I've had, I have back pain, so go into the frequency. Um, all of these, the lat found were hallmark, were not hallmarks of unremitting pain. Um, further, the evidence didn't show that the symptoms were intrusive. The applicant was working with modifications, was continuing to perform home activities with pacing, was still going fishing, was still going hunting. Um, so again, not to say that this means the client has to, you know, be bedridden and on the couch and doing nothing because we all know that that just makes you worse, right? From a psychological, from, you know, just a feeling good point of view, you can't spend your days laying on the couch in pain. You've got to get up and try to do things. So when it comes to reporting, keep these things in mind, right? Just because 
you, they can do things doesn't mean there aren't still limitations. Um, what else did they say? And the, you know, there was no demonstration that the symptoms were not susceptible con to conventional methods of treatment, which is they were using Advil, they were using Tylenol. So this is a really crummy decision because I think if there had been proper reporting um, or more fulsome reporting, if the, um, if the expert hadn't sort of, you know, gone that one step further and really elaborated more, um, this guy probably would have gotten out of the MIG and would have gotten the, the um, information, the, sorry, the information, the, uh, the treatment that he probably, he probably from the sounds of it really needed. So it's an unfortunate decision, but again, um, it just goes back to consistency and reporting, taking that extra time, asking those extra questions. Yes, and, and uh, sorry to interrupt you, Stacey. I'm just getting a signal. We got to wrap it up, yeah, actually. Sorry, I, I know it's that. 1130 and uh, everyone's got to go. So what we're going to do quickly is we're just going to do the draw. Um, I'm going to, I got a bag of numbers here. I'm going to pull a number out and, and Stacey's going to let us know who won. Uh, the winning number is 41. 41, I'm going to put it up here. 41 is Audrey Klein. All right, so uh, Audrey, one of the members of our team will be reaching out to you shortly. Uh, I wanna thank everyone again for joining us today. Uh, quickly, I do know that one of you submitted a question for us ahead of time, and I'm sorry we're, we weren't able to get to it. We're gonna reach out to you after the presentation and give you an answer to your question. Um, Thanks again for joining us today. Be sure to look out for our next webinar session on Thursday, November 25th. Again, that's Thursday, November 25th. More information will be provided on our website. Also, if you're attending tomorrow's Provincial ABI Conference, please stop by the Thompson Rogers booth and say hello. And thank you everyone for joining us. All right, thank you everybody. And hopefully we will be able to come back and continue on with this topic. There are always some really informative and sometimes really interesting decisions that come out of the lat that, um, that we love to share with you. Helps us all do our jobs a little bit better. Have Thanks, a great everyone. day.